Our next speaker is Hannah Bramston, a postdoctoral research fellow in Liz Patton's group at the IGC at the University of um, Edinburgh. Um, yeah, that's great. We can see your slides if you want to mm -hmm. start the presentation. Perfect. Thank you. Great. OK, well, um, thank you, everyone, for coming today. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about my paper about ALDH2 and how it's a um, metabolic regulator of the melanocyte stem cell lineage. If I can get the pointer up. Yeah. Um, so I chose this background slide because um, zebrafish have a um, beautiful stripe pattern, and we use how these stripes um, form uh, from melanocyte stem cells. And um, we want to know how this changes in melanoma and how it connects to melanoma. Um, so to briefly introduce ALDH2. So ALDH2 um, is part of a family of 19 different aldehyde dehydrogenase enzymes. And these remove toxic aldehydes um, in our bodies uh, as a result of environment or natural metabolism. So ALDH2 is most well known from removing acetaldehyde and turning it into acetate. And if acetaldehyde accumulates, then um, you get sort of DNA damage um, and this is really bad news. Um, it's also uh, ALDHs as a family are known to mark different uh, blood stem cell niches um, and different stem cell niches. And ALDH2, as well as ADH5, a closely related enzyme, have been shown to um, break down formaldehyde into formate. And I'm sure I don't need to tell everyone, but formaldehyde is incredibly toxic. And if people are unlucky enough to have uh, mutations in ALDH2 or ADH5, as well as problems with uh, DNA repair, um, they get um, something called AMED syndrome, which is hallmarked by having acute leukemia due to uh, death of all of these blood stem cells and a range of other defects as well, which kind of led us to think that maybe um, ALDH2 is important in other stem cell compartments as well, although this wasn't known. Um, so as I mentioned, we're a melanocyte melanoma lab. Um, so I, um, I wanted to see whether ALDH2 was important in the melanocyte stem cells. Um, so I'll just briefly introduce what these are. Um, so in the zebrafish, there are two different um, waves of melanocyte development. So the first wave is directly from neural crest cells. So um, this is uh, early in development, um, a neural crest cell expressing a, a multipotent pan-neural crest marker, crestin, starts activating the, um, the melanocyte tran master transcription factor, MITFA. And, and this kickstarts the uh, differentiation into uh, melanoblasts and then melanocytes. So this provides the embryo pattern. Um, later in development, and in order to have enough melanocytes to make the famous separatist stripes, um, the melanocyte stem cells, which are um, separated, uh, like sequestered apart from the neural crest early in development, are uh, activated by some unknown mechanisms. And, and this uh, recapitulates the um, developmental program, and you get um, formation of melanocytes from these melanocyte stem cells. And this is what they look like in vivo. So here is um, a 96 HPF um, zebrafish embryo. And um, if you photograph from them from the side, you can see um, in red, we've got markers for neural um, tissues and melanocyte stem cells are highlighted in green here with MITFA and GFP. And these um, melanocyte stem cells reside up the dorsal root ganglia and then they, uh, they divide and differentiate and they travel down the nerves to repopulate the skin. And so as we, I said that this is quite a mysterious, uh, we're still learning a lot about this population. Not much is known about um, how the transitions work in this reactivated lineage. So the first hint that we got that ALDH2 might be involved in this process is from a, a data set that my colleague Alessandro Brombin um, recently published in Cell Reports. So he did single cell RNA-seq um, at 24 HBF, so first day of development. And he found this um, population of myelocyte stem cells marked by TFAP2B. And I found that ALDH 2.1 and 2.2 um, were uh, expressed in a subpopulation of these genes. So ALDH2 is definitely expressed in stem cells. Um, but then I wanted to know whether they are actually important in this um, 
this compartment or not. Um, so um, what I did is to um, isolate specifically the monocyte stem cell lineage and bypass the embryonic lineage. Um, we're lucky to have this temperature sensitive mutant in our lab where we can just follow the monocyte regeneration. So this is a temperature sensitive mutant of MITFA. If we culture the embryos at 32 degrees, um, then the, um, the MITFA is spliced incorrectly and the embryo is completely white. But when we downshift uh, the temperature to a cooler temperature, this uh, means that MITFA is spliced correctly, allowing um, melanocyte differentiation from melanocyte stem cells instead of um, from the embryonic source. So I add an ALDH2 inhibitor, a small drug called CVT10216, to my embryos during regeneration. And I found a dose-dependent reduction in melanocyte regeneration potential. Um, whereas if I added this to embryos that weren't undergoing regeneration, it didn't seem to affect pigmentation at all. So this suggested that not only was ALDH2 expressed in the stem cells, but it was, had a specific requirement for regeneration. I won't go into this um, for interest of time, but I also recapitulated this, fight, um, this finding using a double ALDH2 genetic uh, knockout line. Um, so then I wanted to see what was happening um, at the cellular level to get a handle on the, the mechanisms that were working. And um, so I looked um, at both at the um, um, monocyte stem cell niche using this double uh, transgenic embryo. Um, embryo line, and they express MITFA, Rutagri PFP, and also uh, Creston M cherry. And during normal development, the monocyte stem cell niche, you can see that ordinarily both of these transgenes would have faded by this point, but during a regeneration context, they re-express both of these transgenes. You can see the monocyte stem cells um, in the niche. Um, and when I follow this over time, you can see that a cell expressing a mixture of both of Creston M. cherry and MITFA GFP um, starts uh, becoming active in the niche. So they upregulate the MITFA GFP, and these cells kind of bud off the niche and go off, uh, presumably to differentiate further in the epidermis. What was interesting when I added my ALDH2 inhibitor was that it didn't seem to affect the Creston M cherry expression. So this means that the, the niches were able to specify fine, but there was something wrong with um, their ability to transition into uh, the type of green cells here that would be able to, to generate progeny. And the whole niche uh, was, was kind of a lot quieter, suggesting that um, they were held back in some kind of quiescent state. So, um, we were scratching our heads about um, why this was so specific. And um, in the meantime, I started looking at how, um, whether we could understand what was happening by lo looking for the substrate of ALDH2. And I did find that um, these, this melanocyte stem cell lineage was really sensitive to uh, formaldehyde. So when I added formaldehyde at sublethal concentrations, I got a specific reduction in uh, regeneration, melanocyte regeneration. Um, and this effect was really drastically worsened in my ALDH2 mutants, uh, suggesting an additional sensitivity here. Um, and I assume that this was to do because the formaldehyde was allowed to accumulate, this was killing the cells, as we uh, saw in previously published blood uh, stem cell papers. But when I added um, sodium formate, the end product of this reaction, I actually got a really uh, drastic rescue of the MITFA GFP cells after um, ALDH2 inhibition, and um, also in, in turn uh, regeneration. So this had almost completely recovered. Um, so this sort of suggested I was thinking about this a bit backwards. Um, so instead of it being cytotoxicity was the primary um, problem with formaldehyde, it might have been um, there was a problem with downstream metabolism, a result of there not being enough formate to go around. And support for this came from when I started reading work from the KJ Patel lab, and they show that ADH5, which fulfills the same function as ALDH2 in a cytosol, um, they showed that excess formaldehyde could be shunted um, to generate formate, and this was going into the one carbon cycle, which is an ancient pathway that, amongst other things, generates purine and pyrimidine nucleotides um, when cells are dividing really quickly. And so I wanted to see what would happen if I uh, inhibited the cycle. So I added the drug methotrexate to my embryos during regeneration. 
And I can see that the monocyte stem cell niche was sensitive to this drug as I got a loss of MITFA GFP uh, expression in melanocyte stem cells. But this loss was much worsened um, after I um, added, well, in, in the ALDH2 mutant background, suggesting that um, formate metabolism, uh, formaldehyde metabolism in melanocyte stem cells is really important. And the ALDH2 loss makes it worse, so it must be contributing towards this process. So to get more of a handle on um, how this, this landscape of metabolism might be changing as a result of ALDH2 inhibition, we did some single cell RNA-seq. Um, so I took some regenerating uh, um, embryos and I enriched the melanocyte stem cells by isolating um, M cherry positive, GFP positive and double positive cells from the trunks and sending this for 10x sequencing. I won't show you the whole data set today because it was pretty massive, um, but I did find uh, three different pigment cell um, types that you'd expect in zebrafish, so the yellow xanthophores and the silvery iridophores, um, but we also got two different putative melanocyte stem cell clusters. And when we looked at the uh, expression of the transgenes, we could kind of separate these into clusters 2, 6, and 12, which expressed high levels of crescent M cherry, but low levels of MITFA, and clusters 7 and 11, which expressed low levels of um, MITFA, but uh, sorry, they expressed high levels of both transgenes. And when I did differential expression analysis between these two clusters, I found that there was a much more metabolic enriched signature in the MITFA low uh, subtypes and a much more pigment directed um, signature in the MITFA high uh, cluster group, um, which kind of backs up what I was seeing with the imaging. Um, so then I wanted to know, well, what effect does the ALDH2 inhibition have on this? And at first it was quite anticlimactic. So you can see when I separate out this data set, there's not actually that much difference um, in terms of cluster identity. So ALDH2 inhibition isn't you know, powerful enough to, to grossly change the, uh, the fate of these cells. Um, but what I did find was that proportionally it was changing the um, the proportion of cells in each cluster group. So um, confirming what I saw in my imaging, um, in my ALDH2 inhibitor treated cells, I had less cells in the Creston positive MITFA high group. And what seems to be sort of a backlog of Creston positive MITFA low cells, um, suggesting that it was more the balance of these cells um, that was affected. So I wondered whether um, there might be something if I look within these cluster groups that might uh, suggest what was going on. Um, so what I did was I went through all of these different clusters and I did differential expression analysis between DMSO treatment and ALDH2 inhibitor treatment. And um, I found a specific signature in these Creston positive MITFA low cluster groups. And um, this was hallmarked by having um, enrichment for terms to do with form one carbon cycle and particularly de novo purine biosynthesis. So all of the genes that are in this um, pathway here in red were significantly upregulated um, after ALDH2 inhibitor treatment. Um, and interestingly, this was um, this was specific to uh, this cluster group, and I didn't see it in any of the others, even the ones that rely on this pathway um, to make their pigment. So to validate this kind of experimentally, I kind of went back to my in vivo work, and that's what would happen if I added purines back in to um, my ALDH2 inhibitor treatment. So as before, if I add an ALDH2 inhibitor, I get a specific loss of the MITFA GFP like activated monocyte stem cells. Um, but this was really significantly um, or clearly uh, rescued when I added purine nucleotides to the culture media. Um, and interestingly, this rescue uh, was specific to purines, as I didn't see the same thing at the same dose with pyrimidine nucleotides, um, thus suggesting that, that purine nucleotides are really important um, for the melanocyte stem cell regeneration. And maybe this is where um, ALDH2 is directing its, uh, its function here. So um, what I hope I've shown you 
today is that um, ALDH2 formaldehyde metabolism is really important for a transition between quiescent and active melanocyte stem cell state. Um, and that this lineage, for reasons we don't fully have a handle on yet, is sensitive to deficiencies in formate, the one carbon cycle, and purines and ALDH2 is a significant source of carbon for, for this process. Um, going beyond its uh, classic role in sort of removing aldehydes. And what I really want to do next is to see um, whether this metabolic signature might be conserved in human melanoma as well, which is particular clinical re relevance as actually 8% of the world's population have a loss of function mutation in ALDH2. So this could create uh, potentially problems in their stem cell metabolism that we haven't fully uh, understood yet. Um, so with that, I'd like to thank um, everyone in my lab and um, the technical staff here that have really helped me with the 10x work and technical stuff. And um, yeah, I'd be happy to take any questions you might have. Thank you, Hannah. Um, we're running slightly behind time, but we probably have questions. For, we have time for one um, one question. Um, please feel free to put any questions you may have in the chat. So James is asking, do you have any speculations why there is a requirement for pure synthesis for the transition? Um, that's a really good question. I don't honestly know. Um, what I can say is looking at other data sets in human cell lines and in melanoma, that um, conversely, ALDH2 high populations have an enrichment for purinergic signaling. So I wonder if it's something to do with needing those purines for uses that's like not to do with energy, but it might be to do with communicating with other cell types. That'd be really good to test. Mm -hmm. along, the, along those lines, actually, is there, so is it ALDH2 sufficient? Did you try over expressing it a slightly different time point? I haven't actually, that would also be really good. I have added an ALDH2 activator and I got a mild um, upregulation of um, the regeneration potential, but I'm not sure how, yeah, how um, drastic that is sort of genetically. Okay, right, thank you. We